Okay, because we're recording inside, it's easy to see the front page of the Times. Um, Johnson sets out lockdown exit plan. Or sets out lockdown exit plan. And I've commented on Twitter. If you want to see me on Twitter, I'm uh, at Paul Crossland, C R O S L A N D. Um, yeah, to say the first one again. I, the Times today, Monday, May the 11th. Yes. Um, we had a speech last night, uh, which I can show you again later, because you did fall asleep during it, Dad. Oh, dear. Um, <laughs> it was of Boris Johnson explaining how we come out of this lockdown situation. Um, there yeah. are five rules, huh. um, five tests, that need oh, um, guidelines, I've forgotten, um, that, that the rate of reproduction of the virus needs to be um, kept um, low um, and so that will affect whether whether schools are allowed back in June for three years they only want to get the what? They, they, only, they only want year one year uh, the reception year year one and what's called year six the final year of primary school those those may go back in June Pub, some pubs may open again in July and restaurants. I mean, all, all t restaurants and pubs, are, pubs closed. are closed at the moment. There's a few exceptions that are doing takeaway delivery, but no one can go in to a pub or a restaurant. They are closed by government. By government? Yes. Um, these are extreme times, Dad, and each day you read a letter about the coronavirus. Um, extreme measures were needed um, for the People's War, the Second World War as well. So I'm taking up reading this to you again, and I believe we were on page 74. Um, so I'm going to read section 7 from chapter 2, um, the section, the chapter called The Strangest of Wars, September 1939 to April 1940. Um, yesterday we watched um, The Darkest Hour on BBC iPlayer, a film that I saw in Sheffield at the cinema when it first came out, and I love... Um, Gary Oldman plays Winston Churchill. There are so many things in that that I draw from, including the quote um, that it's only through your doubt that you have wisdom. Um, something like that. I have not, not quite accurate enough. No. But um, anyhow, and the final sentence of the whole film is about um, marshalling the English language and sending it into battle. Um, Sending the English language Which into battle, yes. How many people can the English language kill, Dad, if you deploy it well? Um, no, Did we, you ask the question? Kind of. Um, do you think the English language can kill people? No. You used to tell me sticks and stones will break your bones, but words will never hurt you. I used to say that, didn't I? Yes. But I don't, I'm not holding, you don't have to... Um, account for all the things you used to say dad we're not doing that with if you have any memories or questions relevant to the second world war as i read this out let me know dad 1940 provided the coldest january and february for 45 years oh the thames froze hard for eight miles of its length oh dear mainline expresses were sometimes a day late huge falls of snow added new perils to the blackout in the cities and cut off villages and even towns from the outside world. What news there was divided the British people rather than united them. On January the 6th, Leslie Hoare Belisha, the Minister of War, was sacked. Oh. The breezy Belisha Why? had struck the general public as after Churchill, the most warlike member of the government. Belisha beacons, the road safety device which he had introduced the, before the war, still testify in Britain's streets his talent for self-publicity. He had been at the War Office for nearly three years, had modernised the pattern of the army and was regarded as a good friend of the private soldier. It was said, not, all altogether, not, not altogether without cause, that his dismissal was due to the resentment which the brass hats and Colonel Blimps felt for his democratising touch. Oh dear. So that's a bad reason to sack someone because yeah. um, they... Well, that's an interesting question. How much democracy can you have in an army? You may be defending democracy, but how much democracy can you have in an army? I think what is actually being said is that there, is en there was envy 
from some of the senior soldiers as to how well the Minister of War got on with the private soldiers. Uh, uh, too, yeah, he was too chummy. Yeah. Uh. Anyhow, meanwhile, the war which the Russians had launched against their neighbour, Finland, was creating hysteria in political circles. The Russians were attempting to improve their frontiers in case of aggression from Germany, but even the left-wing Tribune could find no excuses for this action. The TUC and the Labour Party denounced it forthrightly. D.N. Pritt, MP, who defended Russia's actions with all his considerable gifts as a propagandist, was eventually expelled from the Labour Party for doing so. The press found no praise too high for the gallant Finns. For that matter, Chamberlain's cabinet was far more interested in helping the Finns against communism than it had been in aiding the Poles against Hitler. In January, a Bureau for Recruiting opened in London and 500 volunteers enlisted, of whom 300 reached the front. Several score of British aircraft were rashly sent. Apart from the communists, prominent voices in the Labour and Liberal parties opposed what the owner of the loudest of them, Hugh Dalton, called Midwinter Madness, and public opinion was strangely unimpressed by anti-Russian propaganda. A poll taken after the Finnish war had ended showed that about five people wanted Britain to have closer relations with Russia for everyone who thought she should be shunned. The British and French agreed early in February that they would prepare an expeditionary force for Finland, and some 100,000 troops were assembled. Wow, they ne Britain nearly and France nearly sent 100,000 troops to Finland. There was, a, there was a little method in this madness, for all that it might have ranged another powerful enemy against the Allies. The idea was that by striking through Narvik in northern Norway across Scandinavia, the Allies might cut the Germans off from their supplies of Swedish iron ore. The obstinate neutrality of Sweden and Norway frustrated this chivalrous scheme. On March the 12th, the Finns accepted Russia's peace terms. The fierce winter gave way to a spring of peculiar brilliance and loveliness, Ooh. of hot sun and blue skies. You were in Hattie Town at this stage, Dad. What's that? Oh. Yes, enjoying the, when was the hot it? sun. What, we're yeah. talking about um, spring 1940, April oh, 1940. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Things really changed after April 1940, but we'll come to that later. OK. Um, militant patriotic songs were losing their popularity, and a haunting sentimental number called We'll Meet Again was the latest pride of Tim Pan Alley. Yes. Can you sing it, Dad? We'll meet again. Uh, no, I can't sing. How about this? Yeah. We'll meet again. Don't know where. Don't know when, but I know we'll meet again some, some sunny day. Keep smiling through, no, the though night. our hearts may be blue, I'm guessing. Yeah. And then we both peter out at this stage. Yes. But I know we'll meet again some sunny day. Ooh, um, ooh, bum, ooh, bum, ooh. Bum. That's too fierce. Uh, guess how old Vera Lynn is now. Who sang that? Oh, it's a hundred. And three. What? Yes. Goodness me. Yeah, she sang it out of her window the other day um, for the VE celebration, 75th anniversary of VE celebrations. I didn't see the film of her singing out the window, but I did see a recent interview with her. Mm -hmm. So, well, um, Easter fell at the end of March. Trippers flocked to the coast for the four days holiday and seaside resorts did as well as in peacetime. The Allies had long suspected that Hitler would make an offensive in the West when spring came, but Chamberlain remained willfully and wishfully optimistic. See the film The Darkest Hour. You won't be a fan of Neville Chamberlain after seeing that. On April the 4th, he made a speech which was remembered later as cru cruelly as his promise of, of peace in our time. The Germans, he told the Central Council of the National Union of Conservative and Unionist Associations, had had their chance in September when their war preparations had been far m more complete than the Allies. Now they had lost it. Hitler had missed the bus. Next day, the Daily Express published an interview with the Chief of the Imperial General Staff, General Ironside. 
His message was the same as Chamberlain's. Our army has at last turned the corner. We are ready for anything they may start. Oh dear. Three days later, the Boer War, B-O-R-E, war was over. The Allies violated Scandinavian neutrality on April the 8th, mining Nor Norwegian waters in the hope of thwarting German shipping, which had made good use of them. Hitler, who had expected the Allies to try to catch this particular bus, promptly walked over Denmark and landed troops at several points in Norway. The Norwegians, fighting bravely but hopelessly, appealed for aid. The first troops sailed on the 12th. The, uh, that means British troops. Yes. The expensive education in geography, which was to familiarise the British people with such hitherto arcane place names as Veli Velikie Luki, Kharkov, Tobruk, Benghazi, Bataan, Okinawa, Lubeck and Hiroshima began with Narvik and Trondheim. By the time the course was over, some 30 million people of all nations, relatively few of them British, would have been killed. Relatively few of the 30 million people. It's more than 30 million. I think Russia is now claiming 27 million alone died in the Second World War. Can you believe that figure, Dad? 27 million people, Russia, may have lost in the Second World War. Good it used to be 20 million when I did uh, A-level history, I thought. Not that I did the Second World War as A-level history. This is a real education to me now. We have finished Chapter 2, and we'll be starting Chapter 3 uh, when we feel like it. Good.